Yeah, welcome back to the Platform Studios, and we just finished listening to two, the first two speakers for the platform today, two amazing presentations by Indidi Umuneli and Mr. Shegun Adeni, and I think that those, they were thought-provoking sessions, and I'll just come back to our panel. Yes, I know that we all watched it and we all had so many thoughts. Let's focus on Indidi first, and she spoke about agriculture, the issue we have with malnutrition, facts and figures that I think were necessary first for awareness just to open people's eyes to the magnitude of the problem that we are facing. What was your takeaway on that opinion? You know, um, thanks. The, what struck me first of all was uh, this communication. It's always on point, talking to the people and reaching you where it, you yes, remember yes, it, yeah. you know. And I was uh, amazed at the fact that she touched on all the points that um, Pastor Kodjo had talked about earlier, about the point about the platform. Mm. So personal, organizational, and national. And you could see literally in the discussion about agriculture and its impact, from there the subject matter to what she was doing as a person with her husband and what they were doing as an organization to build awareness, understanding, and then capacity to make change within the society. And some of the things that touched me especially were things about the difference that you can make. Yeah. And if I go quickly to the end where it says, guys, just buy local food. And if we can build that entire ecosystem, we can make a huge difference to the outcome of Nigeria just in that agricultural space and change the, the situation and the narrative about hunger and malnutrition. I'm glad you mentioned that, and I'll take this question to Tola. One of the things she said was spending less on food. And I know that even here we're talking about, so how do you really spend less on food? How do you think we can spend less on food? I mean, so for me, it's... Um Again, buying local, like he mentioned, and in fact, buying local is even buying healthier for me. So people think um, imported food is better, but then when you think of preservatives and all the things needed to bring food into Nigeria, buying local makes you, it's more nutritious, it's cheaper, and it helps the economy. First of all, we're spending less on efforts mm -hmm. trying to bring in, in food. So even things like, you know, substituting um, sweet corn, substituting... Um, things like rice, chicken, local chicken as opposed to imported Brazilian chicken that like you don't know <laughs> what's in it, you know, things that are soaked in all sorts of things. So, you know, buying cheaper and then for us as well, um, going sometimes to the aggregators, if you're a large um, purchaser, going directly to the aggregators who buy from the farms. Because one of the biggest problems with food in Nigeria is getting it from farm to market. Mm -hmm. So for if you know that you're a big purchaser, then you become an aggregator and that's even income for yourself and income for the farmers out there. So again, so even buying local is not even more of an economic thing for me. I think it's even a nutritional thing. Yeah, issue. a personal right. thing. A personal right. thing. Fantastic. Right. So, Ji, what do you have to say to that? Well, I, definitely. I mean, Indidi is someone that walks the talk. Um, um, you know, she's, she's in the space. Um, she's even also, you know, contributed to policy at the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like about it, like uh, Obina said, was basically the uh, personal and the organizational and then the national dimension. But a few things that she mentioned, uh, we've talked about personal and organizational. At the national level, really, um, so there's the story around, you know, spending 10% of the budget, you know, uh, at least 10% of the budget, you know, on agriculture and all of that. Um, we know the constraints of funding nationally. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that, you know, even the government begins to seek innovative ways, you know, of funding this. Um, you know, there's the capital market where you can actually, you know, raise funds through. Um, there are, you know, just innovative ways, thinking through, you know, how exactly to fund agriculture. Because if it must be, you know, uh, the mainstay and the competitive advantage that Nigeria has, then, you know, it, you just need to take another approach to it. And that's, that's where I'll leave it. Fantastic. We have just a couple of seconds before we go back to the Ochimo. But we have to touch on the interesting story <laughs> <laughs> by Mr. Shegwadini and his proverbial cow. <laughs> And he touched on many things, dependency, reform, just your quick takeaways before we go back to the so auditorium. It's interesting that he uses the cow, and this is what I want to talk about, because he says push the cow, well, he didn't say that, but he said, look, he said the solution it. will be, <laughs> <laughs> push the cow. But what I like about it is that this cow, you know, is agriculture in the sense, you know, so it's just trying to tell you that, look, while you may say substitute, um, you know, oil for agriculture, it's really not about that. It's about the nation's competitive advantage, whatever it is, and using it in the right way. 
and knowing that even that competitive advantage will evolve. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So if we say agriculture today, we're not talking about subsistence agriculture. No. You know, we're talking about mechanized farming, you know, plantations and doing things that can feed 200 million people. And that's not holes and cutlasses in the sense. So that's that's something that we should take away from okay, that. Okay, before we go quickly, any further words on that? No, I, I think I'll just say, look, that I like the fact that um, Shewan Dini tells these stories and then still gives you a point of an action. Absolutely. So if we went away, he says to us, look, practically speaking, how do we stop using these oil proceeds to fund recurrent expenditure? Mm -hmm. So let's go think about it. The moment you move away from something so basic, you can direct critical mass to things that change lives and create productive capacity for the future. Many things to think about, and that is why we are having the platform today to create thought-provoking things that make you go back and think about how we, on a personal organization and na organizational and national level, can begin to grow issues in our society and overcome them. But we have to go back to the main auditorium now for the next two speakers of the platform, and we will see you afterwards. You're welcome back to the platform, Nigeria. We are live at the Covenant Place, Igomu, Lagos. Our next speaker at the platform this morning is Sarah Lacey. Sarah is one of America's foremost technology journalists and authors. She is the founder, editor-in-chief, and chief executive officer at Pando Daily, a web publication that offers technology news, analyses, and commentaries about Silicon Valley-based startups. Sarah is regarded as a legendary tech journalist and truth teller as a result of her trusted reputation for investigative journalism and spot on analysis in tech trends, disruption, entrepreneurship, and everything Silicon Valley. Let's welcome to the platform this morning, Sarah Lacey. A warm applause, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is my third time in Nigeria, third time speaking at the platform. And as, thank you. And I live in San Francisco, that is not an easy journey. It is about 2 a.m. my time right now, so bear with me. Uh, but one of the reasons, there's so many reasons I love coming here, and um, one of them is, I come from a long line of Southern Baptist preachers. Right? Who all, I think, look down at me from heaven, writing about these morally bankrupt billionaires, and think, what has she done with her life? <laughs> and then every three years or so, Pastor Poju invites me to come here, and I get to feel like I'm preaching and making them proud. <laughs> So in that vein, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship today, and I'm going to talk about some of the enablers and the obstacles to growth, and I'm going to tell you these stories like parables. And if any point you want to give me an amen, I'm sure that would make my grandfather incredibly proud. All right. I'm going to get started. First, I'm going to open my water. All right, there's a phrase in Silicon Valley when it comes to entrepreneurship that what's so hard about it is you're not pushing a cow off the cliff, you're jumping off the cliff, and your belief is you're going to figure out a way to assemble a plane on the way down. And that first half is pretty much all we focus on in Silicon Valley and what most journalists focus on, but there's also the trick in keeping the plane afloat, learning to pilot that plane once you've built it. Now, I've spent more than 20 years as a journalist in Silicon Valley, and not only have I gotten to interview some of the most famous, esteemed billionaires who've built some of the companies we rely on today, but I've had the unique position of, I frequently first interviewed these people when they were nobody, before they had even started their companies. And I've had this unique lens of being able to see that journey. And what is it, at those earliest moments, where people like me and the people who invest in them, the people who work for them, glimpse something great. And then what happens when they achieve it? One of the, one of the things that I've noticed is that great entrepreneurs are just wired differently. 
We think about entrepreneurs taking risk or being contrarian. But in my experience, it's not so much that they wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to take risk and be contrarian. They're wired so that they see the world differently. They don't think they're taking risk because they think the market opportunity in front of them is so obvious that, of course, they're going to build this thing. Now, we focus on that a lot when we write about these great entrepreneurs. But what almost no journalists focus on is the fact that those same things that enabled their growth, that same wiring that makes that person different from anyone else who looked at that set of circumstances is also frequently the thing that lays seeds for their downfall. And that's what I want to talk about today. So frequently, the things that enable growth are also the obstacles and the things that can bring you down if you're not careful. So I'm going to talk about three entrepreneurs that I think you've all heard about, and then we'll talk about how Silicon Valley itself is grappling with this dilemma. We want to keep doing the things that got us here, but are those things also destroying our future? Now, the first one is Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, there's few people that have built as globally a significant internet company as Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, we said during the break that this is being live streamed on Facebook and Instagram right now. So, hi, Mark. Uh, <laughs> you can see in this photo, this is a picture of me screaming at a very young and scared looking Mark Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> one of the things, you know, I first started covering Facebook as a journalist when Mark was 19 years old and had just moved to Silicon Valley. In fact, to give you an idea of how long ago that was, I called Facebook's offices and he picked up the phone. We could try that right now. It probably would not work. And I spent a lot of time with Mark over those early years of the company. And it was clear that he approached social networks by thinking about data and information and the tiny bits of data and information that we were willingly sharing with Facebook every day because we wanted to share those with our loved ones. And the thing that Mark saw that created a company that may one day reach a trillion dollars in value, but the thing that he saw that's also tripped him up is that people are willingly sharing this data and as long as you're providing them connection, they're not going to really care what you do with it. And what Mark, his blind spot he always had was he thought when we shared that data, who we were going to vote for, what we're reading, pictures of our kids, that we were totally fine with him doing whatever he wanted with that data. That he believed that data was his. And I saw this really early on when um, Facebook, in the first couple years of its life, um, launched the news feed, which is kind of, you know, that central feed when you go to your platform that tells you everything that's going on. There was nothing like this in social media at the time. You had to go click around on your friends' pages to see what was new. But Mark's insight was, well, everyone's sharing this anyway. Let's make it easier to consume. Let's make it easier to, at a glance, see every single thing your friends have done on this platform in the last 24 hours. When he demoed this for me, I kind of took a step back and I thought, this is really powerful, but this is really terrifying. Because I don't think all these people who made these little status changes anticipated it'd be collected and broadcast. I said, don't you think people are going to be freaked out by this? And he looked at me like I had just grown seven extra heads. It wasn't that he thought about that and he decided, I'm going to do it anyway. It hadn't occurred to him. It had never occurred to him. When he launched the newsfeed, it was one of the first scandals in the company's history for exactly the reason that I had pointed out. Now, that blindness is a big reason that Mark Zuckerberg kept charging ahead and built one of the best data gathering organizations and ad organizations we've ever seen. It's a big reason Facebook could impact global elections. And yet, right now, he is making that face from that picture, which is now gone, um, sitting in front of world leaders everywhere because of the terror and the fear and the realization that Mark Zuckerberg still believes when you upload data, it belongs to him, and he's going to make the world better, whether you agree with it or not. <coughs> The second one I want to talk about is Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk is, by any standard, 
the greatest living American entrepreneur right now. There's only one other entrepreneur in Silicon Valley history who's built three companies worth more than a billion dollars, and they were kind of barely over, and that required the NASDAQ.com bubble for that to even work, and they were all in the same industry. Elon Musk has done it through lean times, through good times, and he's done it with three dramatically different companies, PayPal, Tesla, and SpaceX. And he was an early investor and semi-co-founder in Solar City. He doesn't claim credit for that one, but if you gave it to him, that'd be four. I mean, there is no one else who has succeeded on this level. Why is that? Well, people who've known Elon since the early days know that he's missing the fear chip. Now, what's that mean? We're all born among the many things our creators put into our body is a healthy sense of fear that keeps us alive. Elon Musk is just missing that. And I'll give you a story to explain this. Um, this is a little known story um, in Silicon Valley that I actually asked him about at this moment. This is him telling this story in that picture, which shows you he's still laughing about it. So right after um, they sold PayPal to eBay for about $2 billion, um, Elon went out and bought a million dollar sports car as his reward to himself. And Elon and his co-founder, Peter Thiel, were driving down Highway 280, which is this gorgeous pastoral highway that connects San Francisco to Sand Hill Road, where all the venture capital money is in Silicon Valley. They're driving down, fancy new sports car, they've beaten the odds, they've built a huge company. Peter looks at Elon and says, how fast does this thing go? Elon says, I don't know, let's find out, and mashes his foot on the accelerator. Loses control of the car. Car flips. Elon and Peter are thrown from the car, lucky to be alive. They get out on the side of the highway, and Elon starts doubling over with laughter. And Peter looked at him and said, we could have died. You've just wrecked a million dollar brand new sports car. How can you possibly be laughing? And Elon said, oh, you don't know the funny part. It wasn't insured. That is the fundamental psychology that it takes to believe you can build rockets better than NASA. That you can build an electric car company when every global automaker couldn't. Without that way of looking at the world, he would not be the greatest living entrepreneur. And yet, look at the press right now about Elon Musk. He has succeeded so much that he's running multiple public companies People are trusting him and getting in his cars as he's pushing the bleeding edge on anonymous, autonomous vehicle technology. And I would wager that a lot of Elon's struggles right now in the press and with shareholders is that all of those people do have the fear chip, and Elon still doesn't. Okay, the third one I want to talk about is, oh, I may have gone too far, is a very close friend of mine, Travis Kalanick. Now, anyone who has ever read Pando Daily, our investigative journalism publication, knows that is absolutely a joke. There are no two people in Silicon Valley who hate each other more than Travis Kalanick and I. Um, <laughs> this picture was from many years ago when we used to be friends. I think this is the very, very early days of Uber. Uh, I'm pregnant in this photo, and I was pregnant with the same child the first time I came to Nigeria, which tells you how long ago it was. Um, Travis Kalanick used to like come to parties at my house. I think he had actually held that child as well. We had been friends for a while before he started Uber, and he had had a lot of failures before Uber. Uh, he was someone who always wanted to succeed and be this big powerhouse, but never quite made it. And one of the things that was really unique about Travis is he loved to brag about how many people had sued him. <laughs> think about it, you're going into pitch VCs, and you're saying, as one of your talking points, I have trillions of dollars in lawsuits against me. Now, that's something I brag about, but I'm a journalist, so that's kind of different. Um, but that was not a normal thing. He, Travis Kalanick loved breaking laws. He thought laws held everyone back, and the smartest people in the world should not be beholden to laws. Now, without that, 
he would not have built Uber. Transportation was one of the most regulated things in America, and hardcore regulated. I mean, on every level, the national level, the state level, the local level, politicians were deeply in bed with taxi lobbies. It took someone who liked to brag about breaking laws and liked to brag about lawsuits to keep building that company. Because everything like that that happened to him that would give another entrepreneur pause, he viewed as gasoline on the fire. He viewed as a positive job endorsement that he was doing a great job. Now what happens when that's the case? Well, it turned out the venture capitalists who backed him because they were so excited about his reckless disregard for laws couldn't control which laws he was gonna break. And it wasn't just the ones around transportation. The falling out that I had with Travis Kalanick was about some critical reporting that we were doing about the company not doing good enough background checks. And then the company, you know, not treating women very well, both women in the cars and women at the company. He got so angry about my reporting that one of his deputies proposed a million dollar budget to go after my family and silence me. Someone I'd been friends with. And that was not enough for Travis Kalanick to get fired. That was not enough to really even pause the company's growth. After that, Susan Fowler, one of his engineers, wrote an explosive blog post talking about how hostile of an environment Uber was for women. That was not enough to get him fired. There were so many examples of laws and just societal norms he was breaking because he had always got more money and more success and more validation the more laws he broke. And what finally happened was a lawsuit from Google alleging that he stole $8 billion in trade secrets to help build self-driving cars because he was so terrified he was going to lose the lead on self-driving cars. That was finally, finally enough for investors to fire Travis Kalanick. They finally hit that point where for so long they kept saying, no, the things that are so dangerous and reckless about him and the reason we keep getting such bad press is also the reason he built Uber. They finally hit a point where he was collateral damage. So next week, finally, Uber, which has long been one of the most valuable private companies in Silicon Valley history, is going to go public and gonna go public for a ton of money, but he's not the one taking it public. Now, I wanna sort of pull back a little bit, because the more I was thinking about these different entrepreneurs, and these are just three examples, where the thing that made them so great was also the thing that was their undoing, or threatened to be their undoing. I started thinking about Silicon Valley itself. So not only have I covered Silicon Valley for a long time, I spent several years traveling through emerging markets and also do, writing, looking at the opportunities outside of Silicon Valley. And for a long time, I couldn't understand why Silicon Valley VCs could read all of the economic reports about places like China and India and Nigeria and see the opportunity there, but still believe that the best investments were a day's drive or an hour flight away. Now, I've experienced something similar on a local level, being a female founder. 2% of the venture capital money in America goes to female founders. It's extreme, right? So right now, if I were to get a job in corporate America, I would make 15% than a man with the same experience doing the same thing, and that sucks. We focus on that a lot. When you're raising money, it is a 98% gender tax, not a 15% gender tax. So I thought, well, you know, why is this? Because these people are supposed to be data-driven. And the key is in this quote. This is a quote from John Doerr, who's one of the most famous venture capitalists in Silicon Valley history. And he said, to a group of venture capitalists who were trying to figure out how do we be more like John Doerr, he said, if you look at Amazon co-founder Jeff Bezos, Netscape founder Mark Andreessen, Yahoo co-founder David Philo, and the founders of Google, they all seem to be white male nerds who've dropped out of Harvard and Stanford and have no social life. That correlates more with any other success factor that I've seen in the world's greatest entrepreneurs. Now, corporate America has some problems with race and gender. 
I have never seen a CEO say, we are only looking to hire young white males. That is a staggeringly racist and sexist statement of what you are looking to hire. But beyond that, it's actually worse. He is so convinced himself that is the pattern of what makes money in Silicon Valley that his facts are actually wrong in this quote. So Jeff Bezos, for instance, went to Princeton and finished school. He didn't drop out. And he started Amazon in his 30s. His own example doesn't fit the pattern. Mark Andreessen went to University of Chicago. He didn't have the privilege to go to an Ivy League school. And the most jaw-dropping example is when John Doerr is saying this because he so wants to validate this pattern of young, white, Ivy League dropouts equals success, he forgets that Yahoo had another co-founder, Asian Jerry Yang. He just leaves him out of the list. Now, I was so stunned by this that, and, and you know, look, we have tons of data. I have a billion slides of data showing you why, like, gender diverse teams perform better, showing you why working a thousand hours a week doesn't work. I mean, there's data, 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 data about why the Silicon Valley approach to investing is wrong. And this is an industry where everyone says they're data driven. And so I started going around talking to people in the Valley and I was like, I don't get it. You all say you're data driven. I can give you all these studies that show that your companies and your success would be greater if you were more inclusive. So why aren't you? And finally, one VC gave me an honest answer. He said, here's the problem. We look at companies like Google and Apple and Facebook, who the press keep telling us do this wrong. And they've had such extreme success, I don't believe the data. And I stepped back for a minute, and I said to this investor, let me get this straight. You're telling me you think the reason those three companies have had that level of success is because they exclude women and people of color and minorities. Because that was the logical implication of the lizard brain going on in VC's heads that were keeping them from funding anyone who didn't look like this. Literally, look in this room. What, you and I probably don't have a ton in common. We're raised in different countries. But the thing we do have in common is none of these people would look in this room and see a single viable entrepreneur. That is some extreme, extreme bias to openly cop to. And I would submit, that's a lot of what's holding Silicon Valley back. That's Silicon Valley's obstacle to growth. It, is, it believes what it's telling itself are the patterns over the data and the reality. And it leads to this faulty co co correlation in why you think things have become successful. Now, one of the funniest examples of this is young people who come to Silicon Valley and actually start dressing like famous entrepreneurs. And what's even funnier is that they're investors who actually fund them for that reason. And yeah, I know, it's ridiculous. And we were at TechCrunch, we were at a party where there was this guy who was literally dressed like um, he was being Mark Zuckerberg for Halloween. And he kept repeating lines from Mark Zuckerberg, but not even things that Mark Zuckerberg had said, but things that the movie version of Mark Zuckerberg had said. Like, we were like, hi, would you like a glass of wine? And he's like, you know what's cool? A billion dollars. We're like, what are you doing right now? This guy was funded by some of the biggest VCs in Silicon Valley. Could not answer a question for us about what his company did. But they said, I said, how can you believe in this guy? He can't even tell me what his business does. And they said, you know, I look at him and I see a young Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> they literally looked at him and saw a young Mark Zuckerberg. Now, what, some people in Silicon Valley get how absurd this is. Um, after Steve Jobs died, I heard a talk that Larry Ellison of Oracle, who was very close friends with Steve Jobs, gave, where he mocked this idea that people would put on black turtlenecks thinking they were the next Steve Jobs. And he pointed out, not only is this stupid to think a black turtleneck's gonna give you superpowers. I mean, you saw in the, I don't know, 10-year-old headshot they used, I'm wearing a black turtleneck. I'm not the next Steve Jobs either. Um, not only is it silly that that would give you magical powers, as Larry Ellison pointed out, it doesn't even get the point of why Steve Jobs did it. Steve Jobs wore the same thing every day so he didn't have to think about his clothes. So that his clothes weren't a factor. And yet, this is the blind, this is what happens when you're obsessed blindly with pattern recognition. Now, you can argue 
how much is this hurting Silicon Valley venture capitalists? They still seem to be making a lot of money. And in fact, there's so many things that conspire against people funding women and funding people of color in the US that we actually don't know how much it's costing them because you can't run the experiment if they won't fund those companies. But we're starting to see it internationally. You know, several years ago when I was working on my book about emerging markets, I talked to you know, some of the most famous venture capitalists in Silicon Valley and asked them why they weren't investing in these countries. And they told me repeatedly, even a country like China has about 30 years of work to do before they could ever come up with anything innovative or compete with our companies. They looked at a nation of 1.4 billion people and said, these are all copycats. They can't innovate. And there's a couple of reasons that's super racist. The less obvious one is that the greatest Silicon Valley companies were also copycats. I mean, Google did not create the first search engine. Facebook did not create the first social network. But somehow, when they ripped it off and did a better job, it was seen as innovation. But when China was doing that, it was seen as they're copycats and they're not a threat. Well, it's caught up to them. Right now, the bulk of the money going into startups anywhere is coming from Asia and Saudi money. It is not US money. And for the first time in internet history, a Chinese company is building the largest version of the biggest company in the hottest category, and that's ride sharing. Uber spent billions of dollars trying to lead in China, because China is the largest ride-sharing market. It just is. There's bigger me mega cities. Uh, there's more people. Uber had to leave with its tail between its legs after a few years and billions of dollars wasted, because Didi, the local company, had done it so much better. And while there may be still a delta in the valuation of those two companies, that's a temporary situation, because Didi already does about 10 times the ride volume of Uber. We have never before seen a period where the most hyped, highly valued company in Silicon Valley was dwarfed by its Chinese rival. And I think this is just the beginning. So I think the message that I have for all of you in this room, because I know you all are like me, you all get angry about the pride of these people, right? You all get angry, they think they have all the answers, and they don't need to get on a plane to see what's going on in the world. They don't need to look around people that don't look like them to know what's going on in the world. And the message I want to leave you with is maybe you don't need them. Because if Silicon Valley underestimated Chinese entrepreneurs and paid the price, it's great news for all of the entrepreneurs in this room. This is the first time in my life I've ever finished a keynote early. Do you want me to ramble for another 10 minutes, Pastor Poju, or does everyone want a break? <laughs> it is my absolute pleasure to be in Nigeria again. Thank you guys so much for having me back. Thank you so much, Sarah. You know, for those of us in tech, um, not, I'm 